This is a series of talks called Talk Talks, sponsored by CTRL. And uh, I encourage you to think about issues and topics that you may want to hear about and for us to constitute a panel. And so you just email ctrl.america.edu if there's some issues that you'd like to see sort of uh, discussed more broadly. Uh, this afternoon, we have a session on court rights for faculty, staff. And so for that, we have a representation faculty as well as the uh, International Institute for Education that runs the Fulbright Scholars Program. So with that, I will introduce Michelle, who will start off by providing an overview of the uh, Scholar Program, and then we have uh, Dave from Physics and Lizzie from the School of Education, who will have the past winners and will talk about some of their personal experiences and challenges and opportunities and the fun things that arose from their scholarship. Thank you, Kato. Um, Good morning, everyone. My name is Michelle Bellorci, and I am an outreach and recruitment specialist at the Institute of International Education. And as Kino mentioned, we administer the Fulbright Scholar Program on behalf of the State Department. Um, just to give you a little background about the Fulbright Program, um, it was proposed by Senator Fulbright, who's the junior senator from Arkansas. Yeah. And uh, at the conclusion of World War II, he saw that there was some surplus war funds and decided to put that money towards funding. Um, international education program. He had been a Rhodes Scholar to the UK and really enjoyed the experience learning about not only the UK but really about himself and what it means to be American. So he thought the, the best way to prevent another world war would be to bring people together, create mutual understanding and cross cultural exchange through education. And so the Fulbright program is born. Um, it is sponsored by the U.S. Department of State's Educational and Cultural Affairs Bureau. We call it PCA for short. Um, and so we work very closely with PCA here at IIE in Washington, D.C., and we have a few regional offices um, across the United States. And then along with the Fulbright, Binational Fulbright Commissions uh, abroad. So there's like 50 binational commissions that administer the program uh, in those countries. And if there isn't a commission, it's administered by the U.S. Embassy. So to give you a little idea of Fulbright in numbers, um, if you receive a Fulbright, you're in very good company. Um, till date, we've had almost uh, 400,000 uh, faculty, students, visiting scholars, uh, foreign scholars uh, participate in the program. It is bilateral. Um, for this particular program I'm speaking about today for faculty, uh, the U.S. Scholar uh, Program has about 800 grants annually for faculty to uh, go abroad to teach and research. Um, we have about 160 participating countries in the program, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, you're in good company when you receive a full right. We've had several people go on to win the Nobel Prizes, Pulitzer Prizes, MacArthur uh, Fellows, and heads of state government participated in the program. So it is um, very prestigious. Um, but it is, again, a program for the people of the United States. So we encourage everyone to uh, participate and think about it, and not only to have diversity across um, uh, participants, but also in different institutions participating in the program, geographic uh, diversity, etc. So it really is, you know, funded by the U.S. government for uh, United States citizens. Um, to give you a little overview, we also, in addition to the faculty teaching and research uh, grants, we do have a small portion of administrator grants. They're two-week seminars like you um, hit on that a little bit later, um, and then collaborative research. We had a Arctic program um, that brought scholars from different Arctic countries together to do research. But the vast majority, 93% of the grants, are on the scholar program, which I'm speaking about today. So, in terms of eligibility, the baseline eligibility to participate in the U.S. scholar program is U.S. citizenship, and then after that, it depends on the award that you're applying to. Um, and what, what they require. So the vast majority, well, more than half do require at least a PhD or terminal degree, but then others don't, and they require maybe certain years of teaching experience or, or professional experience. Um, the program is open to professionals and artists, journalists, lawyers, etc. Um, and we do encourage uh, vets to apply. And if you've had a Fulbright in the past and are interested in reapplying, we do have a policy that requires you to wait two years from the time and uh, to the time you But there aren't any lifetime caps or an age limit or anything like that. 
Um, so what does this Fulbright, what does the scholar program do? It supports um, North, uh, research or opportunity, provides opportunity for you to teach abroad for as short as two months and up to you know, postdoc grants for 12 months or even longer. Um, this particular program has about 135 countries that it operates in, and there are several awards. The vast majority um, are open to all disciplines, so um, it, there's something for everybody. Um, the, what I'll be walking you through today is the, the process because you're not able to apply for more than one, so you need to be very strategic and select the right award. And I'm joined by a couple of alumni who can kind of share their experience on how they selected the right award. Um, but you come to the program with a specific project in mind that matches that award. Uh, the deadline this year is September 16th. We just launched the new competition. We opened the competition to the application two weeks ago. So you've got plenty of time to start. This is the best time to learn about the opportunities. Um, and in terms of host institutions abroad, uh, they don't just have to be universities. You can work at a, an affiliate with a research center or a think tank, a government ministry, etc. So as I mentioned, you know, half of the battle in this process is really selecting the right award, um, and then the other half is, is putting your application together. So um, when you look at the awards catalog, and I can walk you through that later on, uh, you'll notice that we have 461 awards available. And as I mentioned earlier, 800 scholars will go abroad annually. So there's 461 awards that have 800 spots. So one award might have 10 spots, 10 grants. So it's important to match your expertise, your background, um, the research that you're doing and that you propose to do to that specific award. Some of them really do read like job descriptions. You know, they're looking for an Arctic scholar to go to Iceland to work you know, for four months doing research on XYZ. So they can be very specific. Or a sustainable development uh, grant to Columbia affiliated with the National University of Columbia. So they can be very specific. Um, so it's important to take into consideration your regional experience, any linguistic experience, any kind of thing that would make you really suitable, look like a good match in the, in the community for these uh, eyes. Um, taking a look at the discipline preferences. If it's an all disciplines award, do they list any preferred disciplines or preferred specializations? That's important to keep in mind. Um, and also considering the relevance of your project, not only to that host institution, but the host country as well. Um, it needs to be topical and timely, and, and, and because a lot of the programs that we have, a lot of the grants available are actually co-funded by Fulbright Commissions Abroad. So for example, the UK is a matching funding partner. India matches exactly what we match, so they pay you know, their own part of 50-50. Some commissions even provide more money than the US government provides to that program. So it's important to understand that they've also got a stake in it, and so that's why sometimes the awards can be very, very niche and very specific, um, or even particularly placed. So it might be the Fulbright, Fulbright University of Manchester or the University of Trento. So that means that university is hosting um, that scholar and also providing all the logistical support and financial support. Um, and then to take a look at the different offerings we have. So if you are more early in your career, looking at awards that are open to assistant professors or um, you know, even adjunct faculty are welcome. So don't feel that you have to have a full time um, position to be eligible. Um, you don't even have to have a home institution actually. So that's not required. We also have uh, distinguished chair awards for those of you that are more uh, you know, further along in your career, have a record, a very distinct record of publications and teaching experience. You might consider a chair award and then you'd only be competing with um, other applicants in your position. So we say that always, you know, um, kind of something we like to tell everyone is that um, there's a full ride out there for you. It might not be exactly where you envision, but somewhere along the line, there, there is a full ride out there for you. We've got lots of different um, opportunities available, whether it's through the flex option, if you can't get away from your institution for the whole semester or the academic year, you could break up your research into a couple of different visits through a flex option. Um, again, the different awards that are available throughout your career, as well as if your research requires that you visit a couple countries in that region or a couple countries globally, um, we have the multi-country awards and the Global Scholar Award. So there's lots of different things available. 
um, to take a look at. When you go through the awards catalog, you'll be able to filter for you know, the discipline or grant length and really kind of tailor the results so that you're not looking at 300 awards to go through. Um, and what I will be sharing with Keo is the, um, this presentation so you're able to click on all of these links. We have a lot of guidance on our website guidance on how to procure a letter of invitation. Let's say you want to go to India and you don't know anybody there. How do you get a letter from a host institution? So information about that. How do you approach a host institution? What should be in the letter? Those kinds of things. We also host webinars usually on Wednesdays, so we like to call them webinar Wednesdays. And so tomorrow I'll be hosting a webinar on opportunities specific to the East Asia and Pacific region. Um, last week we focused on Europe, so each week we have the regional webinars, and then we'll also be doing discipline-focused webinars, um, application walkthroughs, so take a look um, and sign up for those along the way throughout the competition. Okay, so in terms of the application components, I'm going to let um, uh, panelists here also chime in afterward to, to kind of give you an idea of what worked for them. But the application isn't anything you haven't seen before. It's an online application, um, but at the core of it is the project statement, um, and then if needed, the letter of invitation or any supplemental information. So these are kind of um, the components outlined here. Um, if language is required, you can do the self-evaluation as well as the external evaluation. That should come from someone who teaches the language. So since you're based at AU, you can just go to someone in the language department, or if not here, another and have them um, fill out the form. Okay, so in terms of the project statement, this um, this is a three to five page project statement that we ask for. So the, the page limits are there. Um, so in five pages, you really need to be able to tell us kind of the whole picture. So we don't require that you um, cite or reference or refer things because we'll be providing a kind of a literature view in the form of the bibliography. So the project statement needs to be as clear and concise as possible because, again, the review committee is going to be made up of not only specialists in your discipline, but also uh, people from a range of disciplines. So first and foremost, I think, is also addressing why you're interested in Fulbright, why this particular grant versus going to a different grant agency. Uh, at the core of the Fulbright program is this that kind of cultural diplomacy, soft diplomacy, you're, you're being a when you're abroad, you're a representative of the U.S. Um, and so really kind of um, addressing why you're interested in the program because, you know, if you are the only American in Kazakhstan that year, you will be the face of the program and also invited to a different uh, embassy events and cultural celebrations um, that they host. And so you, you'll be involved heavily in that or, you know, um, if you're in the U.K. or Italy, when there's um, an American holiday, they might say, oh, look, come and, you know, celebrate with us here. And so there's very much that diplomatic kind of um, face to the program. Um, and then also, what you specifically hope to do, the timeline, why that particular country, how it's relevant, why that particular host institution, is it because the lab they have there, or it's a collaborator, collaborator you've worked with in the past, or they, they're doing a, pro, you know, they have a program that's very you know, closely in alignment with what you're doing, it makes sense that you can go there. Um, so kind of hashing all of that out. And then the outcomes, not only the outcomes that you anticipate, of course we don't have a crystal ball, we can't imagine what's going to happen six months into the grant or you know, the conclusion of the four-month grant, but really what are the outcomes you anticipate not only at the conclusion of your project for you and the host institution, but when you come back, not that the Fulbright ends, you know, when you get on the plane back to DC. So, you know, what are you want to hear about kind of or do you hope to collaborate in the future with that university or perhaps host a foreign Fulbrighter at AU, et cetera, et cetera. So you're going to hear more about the outcomes that both of, um, both of your colleagues had. And then also addressing adaptability and flexibility, because as we all know, things don't always go as planned, whether if you're teaching and the level of English is not what you envisioned, or if the curriculum you had devised is just not appropriate. Um, being able to you know, have a plan B or plan C um, and how you address challenging situations, things like that. So we do want to see all of that um, in those five pages. Um, and then moving on to letters of affiliation, not all awards require a letter of affiliation. Some say it's optional, 
Some might say a letter should not be sought. Um, in that case, the, the embassy or the commission will place you directly where they feel you would be uh, best suited in addressing their priorities and their needs. Um, if a host institution is identified, for example, if it's a partner award, like as I mentioned, the University of Manchester, um, that means they would they would list the contact person's email address and you would be able to contact that person for the letter of invitation. If it's not, uh, if, if the host institution is not identified, then um, you can contact us, you can look at the Fulbright Scholar directory um, that lists all of the grantees to that country from 2010 onwards. So it's a good reference for you. Let's say you do want to go to India, and I keep using this example because I have a crew for India. So um, let's say you want to go to India, you don't have any contacts, your field is biology, and you want to know, well, where have other biologists gone to India? You can see the list of affiliations. Contact the host institutions, or even contact the, you know, the alumni that have gone there and say, hey, how was your experience? Do you recommend this institution? Do you have any contacts you can share with me? I think you can apply. So that's a great resource for you. Um, you can look to see if AU has hosted anybody from that country that they need to go to and kind of contact that person. Again, that's all in the scholar directory. Um, keep in mind that the letter of invitation is non-binding. So especially in the case of those hosted partner awards, they might be providing you know, a letter of invitation to every project or every person who writes to them. So keep in mind it is non-binding. They understand it's a requirement of the um, application. Um, if it's not clearly listed who you should contact, then the uh, person who provides the letter of invitation should be the person you hope to collaborate closely with, or someone in that department who will kind of be your point person. Um, and it, of course, should be on letterhead. And as much detail as possible, kind of conveying that enthusiasm, posting you, uh, showing that your, your work will have an impact there, that it closely aligns with what they're doing. All of that is very beneficial to you, um, not that it's just some boilerplate text. Okay, so how to submit a competitive application? Um, and your colleagues can share a lot more detail, so maybe online you can chat with them more. But really, as I mentioned, addressing the kind of whole mission of Fulbright, the Fulbright program is promoting mutual understanding, um, why that particular host country. We really want to see a clear match to what you are hoping to do and what that country is looking for in terms of the award description. Um, matching of your expertise to the award. Again, mentioning um, your interest in kind of serving as a cultural ambassador um, and, and again the outcomes that multiplier effect addressing how you hope, um, what you hope to gain in country and also when you return. So, moving on to the timeline. Um, as I mentioned, we just launched the new competition. These are for awards in the 2020-2021 academic year. So you would apply by September of this year to go next fall. Um, so we get all the applications in September 16. Um, we review them for technical eligibility. And then in October and November, there's the US peer review. Um, and then uh, in December, Everyone who's selected as a grantee or who's going through the process needs to be approved by the FFSB, the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board. Um, the final decisions are made in country. So um, if, you, if you're not selected, it's really kind of, we don't really have much information to share with you in terms of feedback because that country makes the final decision. They don't share anything with us. But notifications do go out um, anytime as early as January. Um, up until April, so people now, as we speak, are getting their notifications to apply um, last year. And then in May and June, all the paperwork gets sorted out. If you're required to go to a pre-departure orientation in the U.S., um, you'll get notified about that. Typically, uh, pre-departure orientations are held for um, grantees who are going to places that don't have a full right commission. So smaller countries like Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, these kind of places. Um, it's operating through the embassy, what we call post. So if it's not a pushing country, host countries usually have uh, pre departure orientations. Okay, so I'm going to take a, a breath here um, before going on to the, um, to the other components and aspects of the program. I wanted to open it up to Elizabeth and Nate to share their experiences. Sure. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, well, I'm so excited to be here um, today because my Fulbright experience is wonderful. And when I look back on it, it's probably going to be, I said to my husband the other day, one of the happiest times um, we've had as a family. So I applied for academic year 2014-2015. It's the same year I was going out for tenure and promotion. I applied for Northern Ireland Award, which is part of the larger umbrella of UK awards. My specific award was a policy um, fellowship to research policy-related issues, which education falls under. And it was anywhere from three to nine months. And the catch was it was the same amount of money, no matter how many months you went. So I applied for five months, knowing I would take the semester of sabbatical. And we went in late August. I had only one daughter then, who was three and a half. My husband came and went late August till very end of January. I started the semester a little bit late here. And it was, I don't, can't, can't understate what a profound experience it was for us. We all now have a very deep connection to Northern Ireland. Um, I worked with Ulster University, which is up north. It's north of Belfast on the North Atlantic. And I got along with them so well, and we did, we've done so much collaborative research together that they appointed me as a visiting professor for the past four years. So I've had funding to go back the past three years. This is my last year of funding, where I go back and I'm in residence for about a month and work on this ongoing research project on teachers teaching citizenship after the troubles and um, issues of social memory and um, the ways in which their lives outside the classroom affect how they teach. So we go back for about a month, this will be my last summer of that funding, but I can't imagine never not going back to Northern Ireland. The, the place itself and the people there have had a tremendous influence on my thinking and my research, but just on our family life. My daughter, who's three and a half old, three and a half at the time, she's seven now, always likes to say that she's um, half Jewish, half Christian, and a little Irish. And in my little, I actually came home, was a big joke, I'll share it with this room, I don't want to give too much information for you, but I actually came home pregnant from the Fulbright, so everyone likes to say it's a very productive semester. Um, and so Nell was born um, the summer after I got back from Fulbright, but Nell's only three, and she'll still, she'll still talk about Northern Ireland, and when we're going back to Ireland, and she'll bring up random people from last summer that she met in Ireland. So it's part of my children's thinking now, and their imagining of the world. Um, I do want to say I was a Peace Corps volunteer, I do international work. My field is international education. I've done a large project in the former Soviet Union um, before the Northern Ireland project. I would say it's a project for my research, but it's not just part of our lives, you know, the connection to this place and these people. And my husband also does international work. Um, he works in Afghanistan. It's never a possibility for us to go as a family to do a full ride in Afghanistan. We just crossed that off the list. So um, it was easy for us to think about going abroad um, that didn't make us nervous. I'm happy to talk to you about the logistics of how that worked with kids, what we did with our house here, you know, how we made it work financially. Um, but, you know, doing work abroad and being in a different culture, that was not such an issue for us. But I could see if you all had any questions about that. It might be different if you're going to, you know, Cambodia or the Southeast Asia, or we don't speak Khmer, um, but for us it was a pretty easy transition. And I just wanted to make a few notes about exchange, because Fulbright is an exchange program, you know, very similar to Peace Corps. My application was not very academic, actually. My personal statement clearly stated my research project, something I'm genuinely interested in that I've been now working on. Um, and I had spent a week at Ulster University in 2012, so I used that as the reason why this was a good fit for me. This is where I can carry out this research project. But I also talked about bringing my family over. Um, I talked about the things I wanted to do in the community there. And so my application was much more personal than something maybe I was applying for, I don't like the Spencer Foundation or the National, you know, what's the big one, Science Foundation, right? It was really, it was much more personal and heartfelt. Um, and then I also wanted to make a note about this idea of exchange. So as I mentioned, I've been now this visiting professor at Ulster University, but we have so many friends now in Northern Ireland. I think my Christmas card list, I probably send about 10 or 12 Christmas cards over every year. And we've kept in touch with some of the teachers that I've worked with. So twice we posted, um, they've come to Northern University for a tour, a group of visiting um, comparable to seniors in high school, right, who do a DC trip in February. I go to the Northern Ireland Bureau, St. Patrick's Day breakfast now every year. So there has been this exchange personally, but also with institutions in Northern Ireland. 
and we were just saying before y'all came in that my, I have another sabbatical coming up in 2021, and of course I would love to go back there. I might have to 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 think farther afield, and my husband wants to go to Southeast Asia, but I will always be going back to Northern Ireland at some point, you know, whether it's for research um, or whether it's just because it's been such a profound uh, place for us and for our family. So that's short and sweet, but I'm so happy to talk about logistics. Um, I'm sure you have lots of questions about funding and how you make it work on an academic side. So I can't believe how long it's been since I had my full right, which I took at, as a junior sabbatical. I was an assistant professor at my when I went my junior sabbatical. Uh, I took a semester off the spring semester of my third year. Uh, I applied to a very specific program. I applied to one that was specifically at the University of Trento, part of the U.S. Italian Fulbright Commission. Uh, it was specifically a junior lectureship position. They wanted someone to come there and teach a graduate level course, uh, a TH, of course, their graduate students in physics in English, right? It was specifically, uh, I think the motivation for the award was to increase their students' exposure to English. Uh, so uh, I didn't know anybody there at the time. I'd actually made contacts and connections that I still uh, have. But at the time, I didn't really know anybody there. And I was actually sort of in the process of changing my sort of subfield at the time. Um, uh, it was, my course was a near catastrophic failure. Uh, absolutely, uh, uh, what a great way to learn resilience. Uh, <laughs> so, um, right, because it really was an absolute mismatch. I literally proposed bringing active learning techniques to graduate education and physics there. When I showed up to my class, they'd never seen a syllabus before. They'd never seen a list of what you're going to do every day and what I expected them to read. That was not part of the culture of physics courses. And so we took a little while to figure out uh, how to put, I had to sign a piece of paper every day saying I'd actually gone to class. Their <laughs> attendance was not even begun to be expected. You could, you could enroll for a course, and when you were tired of it, you just stopped going. You didn't have to take the exam. That was a different choice. You could enroll for the course, and then you could elect to complete the course a Tuesday. So in other words, the whole <laughs> understanding education from an entirely different perspective, an entirely different... Now, this is before the Bologna, uh, Bologna Court, the Bologna Protocol, which would uh, somewhat standardize more uh, uh, European education uh, after that. So I think things have changed there. At that time, I didn't pay anything. Now I think they pay a little bit, and maybe that has changed some of the culture. Anyway. Uh, so I, I, that's uh, that's the full ride I had. Although when I was a PhD student, I also had a different fellowship uh, to go to a university in Germany. And when I did my first sabbatical after getting tenure, I did a Deutsche Akademische Austauschdienst, a German academic exchange service. I got turned down for Humboldt, but I got to the AAD. Uh, and then my last sabbatical, I, I did a, a university uh, at Aarhus University in Denmark. They had a, the university had a research foundation that I found a match and applied for. So I'm, I'm all in on this. I'm a theoretical physicist. Uh, typically, I don't have a very strong regional or reason to be there, right? Because I'm, I'm doing theoretical mathematical physics. Uh, so it, it's usually just more about either the a good fit for collaboration. Uh, although I, I can really say that, I mean, one of the stories I always tell is one of the one of my articles that was published in one of the best venues, I can still remember how it happened, right? Like when the idea came. And so I go out of my little uh, Trento, Italy, I go out of my office, and I'm sitting at the bus stop. The campus is up on the hill, where it's the towns in the valley, and I'm sitting there, I suddenly get the idea of the connection between entanglement and separability, and I'm uh, thinking, and it's okay, I realize. Where is the bus? It's been 45 minutes, right? And there's been a bus strike. And I hadn't known what was going on well enough. And I had just sat at this bus stop for 45 minutes. But that's, to me, one of the great things about doing these kinds of activities is because you get these spaces when you're waiting for public transportation or when you don't have internet access, ah, right? And then suddenly you're... You have this place where your brain suddenly thinks about things that you often don't have time to think about. And so that's why I 
truly cherish these experiences. I know that's a little touchy feeling. You get networks, you get experience, you get points towards I don't know, tenure and uh, seniority and all these kinds of things. But uh, I also could give a bunch of logistics information. I have a terrible story about power adapters, but it's just <laughs> horrifying. Again, it's a really, it's a great, it's a great place to, uh, to fail spectacularly. Um, so, and then I could also say a little bit after, right? Now, because of this scholar network, people get in touch with me to ask what this is like. And so I have friends and colleagues that I've developed because they've gotten in touch with me to ask about specifically the Trend 01 or, or other kinds of things. And so I think that's one nice thing. Also, sometimes I still get by the Italian embassy, and they, of course, have wonderful hors d'oeuvres. So, so that's <laughs> a, good, a good thing. Um, yeah, so I, I could go on and get uh, more detail also. And again, Fulbright, all props to Fulbright. I hope to maybe do a Fulbright for my next battle. But again, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, there is a world out there. And I also can just talk about um, sort of how you brazenly just sort of go out there and say, hey, there's a pot of money. To get this pot of money that will benefit both of us, I need to find a host, right? And people are usually, I mean, I would be open to this if somebody came to me. And a lot of people are pretty open to this. If you just put yourself out there, stuff happens. Okay, I think I'm going to add. So I agree with having space to like think about stuff. One thing that we loved about our full right here is this little town that we lived in, and we were there. You know, like so most many of the winter, well, December, January, like really rainy and really cold. Everything closes at five thirty. Five thirty. You're home. Like you're home. You got a whole evening. Yeah. Yeah, and it's amazing. And there's no talk about like traffic or like how much daycare. It's like we have conversations about what your kids are going to do when DCPS is off for the week. It's so nice. It's so nice to be in that bubble. So I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I, I, I want to say that again, often in DC, I think we are surrounded by these things that pull us away from campus and pull us away from our scholarly life. And when you're sort of cut off from that thing, there's a lot of chance for you to fill those spaces with things that nourish you. A little bit more, and maybe often you walk around, you don't even know who's a professor and who's a bus driver or whatever, and so suddenly a little bit just lowers the temperature, right? DC is such a yeah. such a type A, oh, type A. I can see some of you were type A. You're already stressing me out, right? But you go <laughs> out, the names in particular, the Italians. Like, come on, right? And it's Italy. Like literally, the day we left, we finally got the visa. They're like, hey, <laughs> My husband telework, which actually is like critical to thinking about like if you have a spouse or partner, what? Yeah. My partner at, at, at multiple of these times was underemployed. Underemployed. So uh, you often ask questions. We don't have to wait until the end yeah. of the session. So if there are questions that are popping up, please. So um, I'm term faculty, and uh, I'm just curious, looking at the sort of the AU bureaucratic process, and if you could talk about um, I mean, you talked about sabbatical, and I, I think from my school, I was the last person to ever get a sabbatical, but, which is not available, but sort of how the, the AU part of, of this process. Do you know what's lovely about a Fulbright? You don't apply for OSP. It's completely individual grant. AU has nothing to do with it. It has no, I think I had a letter of recommendation from a, a senior colleague oh yeah, um, in school of ed, but like that was it. I mean, you don't go through any, it's, it's an individual award, so you have, don't require any, any kind of institutional right, sign, off, sign off or anything like that. In fact, that's why it's important for you, so I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Since you were both on your sabbaticals, it kind of worked out, but we do often get questions. Um, so what do I tell my university now that I've got the grant? And we don't advise it. It's all on a case by case basis, so it's important to talk to your um, department before you apply rather than being in a difficult situation where you're not able to accept the grant because of different policies or what have you. So, some campuses are more Fulbright friendly, others might be the first one to go through it, but luckily, you have some colleagues here who've been through it, so it's important to have those discussions. Yeah, and, and obviously, uh, the term faculty situation, right, is a conversation. I would start with the chair and or dean as soon as, as possible. I'm a department chair right now, and I think in our 
right? But we don't even know how many terms we're going to have next year yet. And so it, it does make, it is hard, right? I, mean, I know we're hoping for four. We only have one so far. <laughs> What's going to happen? So it is hard, I imagine, to get institutional, I mean, just to be frank, right? I can imagine it's going to be hard to get institutional promises to hold a spot, right, for a term faculty member. I don't want to be cynical, right? But I, I just don't know. I, I think but, earlier the conversation the better. Yeah, so say, but in specs is different because there's no everyone is multi-year, single-year contracts, and so I think you all, I think you could, you know, take. And I was going to add also the like financial piece of it is like the the awards are so variable, right? So the UK awards are small, and like I said, it was the same amount of you know pounds sterling if you went three or nine months, right? But there's plenty of you know, I have friends, and you know, we can talk later about this, that have taken a leave and made like a set, you know, living in West Africa and have been able to support themselves fine. And it's, you know, it's a wash, right? So if you did have to take leave rather than have like paid sabbatical or go in the summer for the few the three flex. months, yeah, yeah. The flex. the flex. So that would be primarily for research grants. There are some yeah. flex that allow teaching, but. I, I, I will have in my notes to talk with the Dean of Academic Affairs about how Fulbright's may be impacting term faculty yeah. and see if there's some some resolutions. Yeah. 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 And I guess benefits also. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's totally oh, it's, it's totally the benefits, benefits, right. the benefits it's the and, and how Fulbright sort of is Fulbright covering your whole so income I, or so um, in our case, um, it's how did it work out? So actually, a U colleague. Um, you know, let our house while we were away. We didn't give us our whole mortgage, but like paid us enough. But I'm trying to think, we broke even. Like we didn't lose any money. We didn't, you know, we didn't make any money. I, I feel like our, the Fulbright stipend covered everything I needed in Northern Ireland with like rent. And the UK is cost of things more expensive than if you go to other locations or if you go to like the global south. Um, but it was like child care. We had to buy a car. When we were over there because when you like for five months we needed a car and like so we had to buy a car it was like rent child care research transportation for me um so i think we came out breaking even like we didn't we didn't go into debt doing it but we didn't necessarily say lots of money either yes yeah. so so uh when i was in italy and germany i still had a u i mean and, and denmark i still had a u benefits in denmark of course they have you have a visa, you have wonderful health care. Yeah, and the same in the UK, we fell under uh, yeah. the UK health system. So, so, I mean, I, one of the things we talked about, right, was because so, so we did for, for both the Germany and the Denmark, I took a full year half pay, right? And that, that does have some complications because just literally cash flow and retirement and all sorts of things can be complicated. Um, yeah, yeah, so, so but, if, but in, in no case was it my single source of income. And I think there would be even more complications if that was interesting. If you were on a, a just a flat old leave instead of a sabbatical, it would be complicated. So it's important to also kind of uh, highlight that each country has its own stipend and allocation. So what you get in the UK is not going to be the same as what you get in India or in South Africa. Any other if I could just say one more thing about that particular topic, right? There is the every year the International Travel Award uh, that's at the provost level, which can be on the order of thousands of dollars. I would think that an application to the provost travel award that said I've got the full right, but I sort of did top things off so that the experience is positive would make a very competitive application. Although I've only once been on the judging uh, of that award. But it seems to me that's a reasonable, uh, that, that, that's another sort of pot of money that you could leverage. Could you talk a little bit about how um, you match up with the host institution? Is it by the language level? Is it by research interest, teaching interest? How does that kind of? Uh, yeah, so. Host country institution. Okay, so the first thing is that unless it's stated otherwise, all teaching is in English. <laughs> Um, and that's the goal is that you know, if it's a lectureship award, they really want to have an American there teaching the subject matter in English. So very rarely will it require 
will be worth acquiring language um, background if you're just going for teaching. If you're doing a teaching and research combination or just research, you do need to be able to, if you don't have fluency in the local language, um, or you go to affiliate, you do need to mention how you're going to carry out this research and how that. So is it because the research team you're working with, they all speak English, or the archives are all in English, or what have you. So um, if you can justify that the research can still go on without any local language, that's fine. It's just you might indicate that you don't mind learning a little bit for the day to day, but in terms of the research project, if it can float without local language, that's fine. Um, so you were specifically asking about how to identify hosts. Yeah, so um, I think looking at, you know, what, where the research, the, you know, you're experts in your field, so knowing perhaps, oh yes, you know, in France, this is the leading person, or this is the leading institute that's carrying on that research, or this is the institution that's closest to what I'm working on. That's a good way to start. If you don't have any um, information about that, or you're not sure if that country even is working on that project, you can contact us, and I can actually show where, oops, I wanted to show the, um, the catalog of awards. So this is our site. And you can contact the individual staff member at IIE who works with the commissions on that. And we can say, look, I have an environmental toxicologist who wants to go to India. Which institution should we contact? Um, that was a, a query that I had last week. So you can click on the catalog of awards. Um, I'm going to show you just really quickly. You can see there's 461 here. Um, and I can do a search for you right now once you're disciplined or in so country. Uh, sociology. Okay. Just going to search all. I'm not going to link uh, filter for link currently. So you can see here that there's 77 awards that specifically mention sociology, either as a preferred discipline um, or uh, in the award. And then there's 239 that are all disciplines awards that would be open to sociology as well. So then you can narrow it down further by region or country. So can I do that for you? I just want to. As an example, <laughs> uh, India. Okay, great. So that's what I work on. <laughs> so this is good. So maybe JMU because that's part of the top institute. Or yeah. and, 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 uh, you can also filter it by the topic. So so for India, it's really an all disciplines award. This is the new award in climate um, uh, climate studies, but this is really kind of the main award. It has 45 grants, so it is the largest in the catalog. Um, and it's called the Academic and Professional Excellence Award. So this is open to research or teaching or a combination of both. Um, this is going to be your best friend as you, let's say that you eventually decide that this is the right award for you. All of the information is going to be there. Um, it's open to all level of scholars, including early career, um, PhD or terminal degree is not required. Deadline, this is my contact information. What they're looking for, okay, research, teaching, or a combination of both. Um, the grant length, dates, affiliations are available throughout the, the, the country except for Jungle Kashmir. That it does have a flex option, it gives you some parameters about that. And really, any further information about discipline type is applications are sought in all appropriate disciplines. So you just have to take that one with it. Um, there are some special features. You'll notice this in the vast majority of awards. The region will offer a travel grant. So India falls in the South and Central Asia region. So it's called the SCA, the Fulbright Regional Travel Grant. So let's say you get selected. Once you're in India, you can apply for the regional travel grant, which would allow you to visit another country within the region for up to two weeks to attend a conference or a workshop, etc. So that's kind of an in-country benefit. If we click here, the requirements, we see that a letter of invitation is optional. Um, you can even, for India, you can even provide an email kind of correspondence. Yeah. It says optional. Do they really mean optional? <laughs> we always recommend that you try and get one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that was a planted question. That's good. Um, so, so really, you'll be more competitive if you have a letter of invitation from the host because it shows the review committee, yes, there's a clear match, there's interest from the host. We know where this person could be affiliated. They're willing to provide an office space or a library pass or archives or whatever um, access. So that's that is good um, 
if, if you don't have one, but you mentioned in the application in the project statement that, look, I, uh, these are the three institutions I identified, identified, and I think these are a great match because at this one there's this, et cetera, if you kind of lay it out. Um, so yeah, so applying kind of just um, without any particular host even mentioned in the project statement is not going to serve you well. So identifying one, or you know, that's why I'm saying this is the best time. You can contact us for information and potential hosts. We can contact the commissioner and see what priority institutions they identify. Of course, it's always mentioned, especially in big countries like Brazil, India, um, I'm trying to think of other ones that you know the preference for the scholar to be placed outside of the big metro cities so that there's impact because of course everyone goes to Rio or Sao Paulo when they go to Brazil, right? So having a full writer in an institution where there happen to be like ten or more, right? Um, is, um, I mean, is it really like uh, this big countries and region focus, or is it also and, and then the discipline that is also focus on certain research areas? No, when, when this one says it's um, open to all disciplines and there's not even any specializations mentioned, and I can show you a different award that would say, yes, we're looking for biology, physics, chemistry, and this and this, and within that we're looking yes. for these three uh, things. It won't be like that. It's not, so for India in this case, it's not. Um, let me just point out the other tab really quickly. So information about the invitation letter, they do provide some um, further information here. Comments, they do provide the, the link to Mission. And then the stipend is mentioned here. Um, they provide also, in addition to the monthly stipend in this case, there's a travel and relocation allowance, a baggage allowance, a book and research allowance. So this is a great thing about Fulbright. Let's say you're going in to teach. So I met a grantee who went to Tajikistan. She uh, went for the Temple Award, and she was teaching the English teachers, so you know the, the um, teachers who would then go into the different colleges. And so she brought in a whole bunch of the pouch that she can send all of the, the books that she wanted the teachers to be able to have and then that's something that we don't think we leave with the institution there um, and then in this case dependent tuition allowance so if you bring um, school-aged children they can uh, you can get reimbursed for the because a lot of international schools or private schools can, can cost um, and then the, the different things up for the flex and then there's the country overview of reasonable information so this is where the award description is very important, as I mentioned. It does kind of read like a, a job description, especially for the very um, very niche awards. So if we look, for example, um, under Italy, we can see the difference. So with India, you see it's just kind of the climate award, the main all disciplines award, and the chair all disciplines award. And then here we can see Italy has one all disciplines award, but then a distinguished chair in law at Trento. A junior research lectureship in the department of you know, all of this, um, a lectureship in architecture. So it's very specific. These are all partner awards. If you click on this, they're looking for an expert in Italian American studies to teach at Calabria. So it's a three month grant. They give you the, the, the links here. They will teach you know, these courses. Students will write a tape page, a uh, paper of 10 pages. I mean, this is the kind of level of detail. You know, you will teach two courses three times a week, you know, whatever it is. So it's important to take a look at that. This particular grant can only start on March 10th. So, so having having a look at that. Um, oh, Michelle, I wanted to add. So, for example, yes. like the UK award, there are no special benefits. There's not even travel. I mean, there's like a flat stipend. Okay. So, so be really go. careful. Each one's different. Yeah. Like there's no tuition. Um, and so that's more of my point. Of like just breaking even on that one. Yeah. yeah. I feel like it's yeah. Tuition <laughs> <laughs> and travel. Yeah, here it mentioned six hours per week of class, uh, of teaching. Class size is thirty five students, so you know exactly what you're getting going into this award. So, so that is the um, the awards catalog, and I think we've just got a few more minutes. Let me take some questions or from the grantees. Yes, um, I was intrigued before when you pulled up the one for India that had a regional travel yeah. uh, supplement. Is that for a lot of countries or? If that is not there, would you have to ask for a multiple country award if you wanted to go and visit, for example, a colleague in a neighboring country? That wasn't about so I think it's available for every region except Europe. Yeah. Um, and really, my advice for the multi-country grant. So, for example, um, for Italy, when I, I pull up Italy, what's also going to show are the Schumann Awards. So those are offered by the uh, Commission in Belgium. So this one is, uh, let's click on this Innovation Award. 
Um, it allows you to choose two countries in the EU, so Italy, then that's why Italy pulls up when you click for Italy, um, to do a project that has research on innovation, things like that. Same with the EU affairs. So I only recommend applying to a multi-country grant if you really have strong links to both countries you're looking into. Otherwise, you're, you're more than welcome to, if you're based in Italy and you want to go to Albania, just for the week, it's just quite close, and there might not be a stipend for it, but uh, during your grant, you are allowed to be out of the country for two weeks. So you can go back home or you know, regionally travel. Um, and let me point out last, um, before I kind of close things, I do encourage all of you, if you haven't, um, if you're not already on our contact, kind of, um, the, the email notifications we send out to register with Mike Fulbright, um, we send out notifications on when the next webinar is, application deadline information, um, new awards that might come up. Mostly what we've got now is launched is, is what's going to be for September, but if the Department of State says, look, we have a new award in Latvia or Estonia, then you'll get a notification about that because it matches your discipline. So I encourage you to um, go to my Fulbright. It's on the, it's linked in every award and up here at the catalog. Any other questions? Again, you can only apply for one grant per competition, so it is important to select the right one. We're happy to advise you along the way. Um, so, for example, for this award, you'll see my contact, my colleagues' uh, contact information there. Um, and I encourage you to sign up for the regional award uh, webinars they go over. And you can we do a live QA session. And if you're not able to attend them from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock on Wednesdays, we do archive them, and I can show you where that is going back here. And you've got all the information here on the criteria and the rubric. So this is the scholar directory I was mentioning earlier, where you can find past grantees and where they've gone. And then the webinar schedule here. We archive all of the ones within uh, a week, so you can view them at your leisure. So, so while we wait for more questions, uh, Nate and Lizzie, would you mind talking about how the experiences uh, helped you develop professionally in terms of how you sort of use this experience for, for merit or uh, your appointment and tenure and that sort of thing. Sure. Well, so, I mean, the most, uh, the, obviously, you meet a lot of new people and you expand your international network, network of scholars that you're connected to. And that has direct benefits. These might be some of these people become your collaborators. As indirect benefits, some of them become your reviewers for these kinds of files or for or, or review grants sometimes. Or, or you just meet them in conferences again and oh yeah, now you're on the right. So an, uh, you know what a network is. You make a network, it gets bigger. Uh, so that's a good thing. I mean, I know particular in, in my particular case, um, uh, I, uh, to establish uh, both tenure and now I'm up for, for promotion, I need to establish that I, I have a track record of supporting my, my research, right? So certainly, although they are not external awards as measured by OSP and all that kind of stuff, uh, certainly in my discipline, it, this counts as I have supported my research through these activities. Uh, and particularly in the sciences of AU, there's a lot of pressure to make sure that you're, you're demonstrating that, probably across all disciplines too. Um, uh, and, then, uh, and then again, the, the final, and this is but the, the confidence in the resilience you get from having these terrible things happen, <laughs> mistakes you make and you recover from. Yeah, we're trying to get them to apply. <laughs> yeah, but, but, aren't we, but this is the age of, right, of failing up or whatever. So anyway, I, I'm failing right all the way up. So. <laughs> um, I hear some more, it sounds more like a Peace Corps experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I, maybe I just had done Peace Corps. I, I didn't, um, there was some reason to get involved in the island. I was going to add, so as I mentioned, I applied while I was going to obtain a promotion. Perfect timing, couldn't have asked for nicer timing. My award letter came in sometime in March or so when I could forward it on to the then provost, and it was really nice in my file. Um, like Nate, my field, I don't need a lot of funding to do. I just need funding to support me to get abroad. Um, and the Fulbright, even though the dollar amount is quite small compared to big grants, it's just so prestigious. It's great to have Fulbright. I almost feel like the name of the Fulbright cancels out what the actual dollar amount is. And then in terms of 
my career now moving forward. So the research project I started in 2014 is now my research project, and it's still ongoing. Like I said, I have one more month of going back and collaborating and a little more data collection. But now this is becoming a book, which I'm working on outlining right now, I'm working on a book proposal, something about limitations of teaching citizenship in an alliance society. So professionally, it just helped me continue my research trajectory, and I'll probably go with the next promotion. Not anytime soon, but maybe after this book, um, a full rate definitely played a large role in all that. Any other questions from the, the audience? So, what did you do with your car? <laughs> yeah, so I did, I love, we, I'm now thinking through this. So I don't know if y'all know Susan Chapler. She stayed in our house, and the car was in our back driveway. And then we had to buy a car in Northern Ireland, like 1,200 pounds, and we sold it when we left. Uh, but we were a little nervous. We left it, just left the car. And there are like things that you, you don't, you just have to think through. Like all of our furniture we got for Susan, um, and she's a professor in SIS who had a full right to uh, think Sarah Leon, so you can also look her up. Yeah, speaking of which, I brought up the scholar director that filtered for US scholars. Core is what we used to call it. I mean, we're not trying to remove the word core, but basically the regular Fulbright program um, versus the seminars, for example. So these are your colleagues who have gone. I don't know if they're all still here, but um, you can see where they've affiliated, what they've done, and um, you just click on this person here. For example, you can see uh, the title of their project, where they were based, etc. So, yeah, so that's. A great resource. So, uh, were you suggesting that when you were trying to figure out the whole students' distribution, that it would be better if it's kind of outside the main? It's possible, of course, and it's more attractive. Yeah, I mean, if, 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 it's, if it's something that doesn't require a certain lab, it's only in Delhi or Mumbai or something like that. If it's a project that, be, that can awesome. be conducted in kind of a Smaller city that doesn't always have a full writer or five full writers every year, and that kind of thing. But if not, we understand. And if the project requires you to be in Paris at you know this wherever it is, the, the institute that's only, the only one in the country that has that lab or that researcher or that collaborator, then that's fine. Can I ask you a question? Sir? So uh, it was certain uh, how comparing the different kinds of awards, mm -hmm. it would seem to me that the more specific the award, the fewer applicants there are. On the other hand, maybe there's only one of them and some of them are, but what, what is your sort of feeling about that? Correct. So a lot of people ask me, ask me, should I apply for an all disciplines award or you know, the sustainable chair in biology, the chair biologist? I would say go for the one that is the closest match because you'll only be competing with others in your field. So whereas with an all disciplines award, you know, if you're in the arts, you're going to be competing with STEM applicants and all these other things. Now, in some cases, the all disciplines may be the only one available to you. Um, for example, as I brought up Italy, they were all um, partner awards. Aside from the all disciplines award, there isn't anything for artists that's a hosted award. So all artists, musicians, journalists, anybody who's not law, economics, or STEM, by default has to apply to the all disciplines because all the other ones clearly mention lectureship in biotechnology, lectureship in law, research in what have you. So they're all, you know, so that might be your only bet. Otherwise, if it's, um, for example, to Brazil, that has a lot of other, um, you know, all disciplines at Rio or all disciplines at this, you know, you have to kind of see where your research takes you and what makes sense for you. But certainly, if you have a choice between an all disciplines award and one that matches up to your research and your project, even let's say if you hope to do research, you didn't really want to do teaching, but this grant is really just teaching and research, better to, to take that one um, because you are going to be only competing with others in your field in that particular specialization event. So, yeah. Just a quick question. Um, uh, in terms of the selection process, it looks like there's a two-phase where one is your office and, uh, and then one is the host country. So how does that selection process work? Who's reviewing at both phases? Right. So in the U.S., we convene panels of discipline and, and regional reviewers. So the discipline reviewers are looking at your application. Their their colleagues in your field. Um, they may or may not have been alumni, um, but their colleagues in your field who are looking at the 
academic merit of the um, proposal and kind of you know, all of that. Um, you're looking at the bibliography, you're looking at your, your CV, they're looking to see if you are really you know, qualified and all of that. So that, is, that happens in the US, and then applications then go to um, for the, the final reviewing country, um, and the, the selection committee, the commission, or the embassy could be a whole, the whole gamut of very interdisciplinary approach. So I mean, there, that's why it's really important when I mentioned the project statement to speak to the specialist as well as the generalist because all sets of eyes will be on this. And um, so one great thing to do in the <coughs> application stage before you submit is if you're in you know, the field of education, have a physicist read it or have, you know, have someone in education read your, because it shouldn't be full of jargon. You shouldn't have, you know, you don't need any images or photographs or illustrations. You don't need any equations or mathematical kind of logic or anything in that. It really should just be text that you can read, that the um, commission can understand that, oh yes, even though we're not a biologist or a physicist, we understand the importance of this project for Iceland. So, yep. Um, Michelle, can you just give three words to the administrators program? Yes. Sure. So let's go back to the um, this slide here. So we do have a select number of In any case, um, yes, there it is. Okay, so we do have seven countries that offer international education administrator seminars. These are two-week seminars, kind of exposure visits for administrators of the campus who are either um, in a specific department or even in the broader kind of umbrella of internationalizing the campus. Um, but they, these are the, the countries that participate. Russia is strictly for colleges. Um, they all have different deadlines to note. And um, the idea is that during the two weeks, you would go to not only the capital city, but also the but two, two cities outside of the capital each year that changes, um, that the commission deems you know, important for you, know, you to meet different kind of critical mass of uh, universities and colleges there. Uh, you're not, you know, not going to be signing any MOUs during these two weeks. It's really just an exposure visit. So part of the application requires not only a personal statement, uh, about you and why you are a good fit for this award and, and kind of what your tasks and responsibilities are um, at your home institution, but also we require an institutional statement, how going to Korea, for example, furthers AU's mission in attracting XYZ or bringing, you know, setting up a program in Korea, bringing Korean students, etc. So um, each one of the awards have, is looking for a different profile. I can say, for example, um, India and Germany, let's say, are a little more open to who can apply, who would be eligible. France really only wants presidents, deans, and provosts, so really the high-level senior administrators. So, um, so check out the when you go on the website, you can see each individual award in the description of who is really which their target audience. Um, yes, oh, we do have some time. Yeah, we've we'll got time. So. so um, does, does the website publish data on um, success rates by geography? So are there particular statistics? On yeah. That? So that's regions? the student program. Oh, okay. Yes. The scholar program doesn't, uh, doesn't publish statistics. But what we say, I mean, essentially, and that really wouldn't make sense because, again, if there's um, only three people who study some you know, flora in the Arctic um, that are you know, that Iceland or Norway is looking for, then, you know, some years we might not get anybody apply that year, or some years we might get a lot of people apply that year more, but, but specific to that. So again, if, if there's no quotas, so to, you know, if there's one grant available and just a handful of people apply it, but the commission does not deem the applications to be of full right quality, that will go vacant and then funds will be diverted for other. So so that's what, so just, you know, it's just important to apply to the right award and not and play any kind of numbers that you think might oh well, no one's gonna go here. It's not like that. So yeah. I was gonna ask Michelle said so thinking about in twenty fourteen, so as we mentioned I had this long ongoing project in the former Soviet Union a small place called Moldova. And um, I just kind of go back there. 
I need a new project, not want to go back to the former Soviet Union. Um, you know, I had a small child, my husband wanted to come to school. And I would just, I, I just wanted to do this project in Northern Ireland. And I was like, I'm just applying for this, and I'm not thinking about where I might be more competitive. And, you know, so I think you have to like, think about that. Like, yeah. if you really yeah. are indifferent, you can go multiple places. Right. But, like, I didn't. I was like, I just want to go work with these colleagues at Ulster who, you know, I had met two years ago, but didn't know that well. But like, this is what I want to do. And just wrote a sincere, as I said, not too academic y application. Um, and I don't know if that came through or if maybe, you know, I just got lucky and. There weren't a lot applying for the Northern Ireland policy you know, fellowship, but I just, I was like, this is it. This is where I'm applying and to try to gain it. And now that you bring that up, I would, um, so let's say, let's go back to that example again, where you have the opportunity to apply to all disciplines award or a very niche award, perhaps like at the University of Newcastle or whatever the case is, University of Trento. One way to understand which would be the best fit is to see if the host institution, you know, engaging their interest, if they're not getting a lot of, you know, any reply or any, you know, if it's a lukewarm reply, that might not be the maybe, perhaps not at that partner supposed to, you know, maybe go for the all disciplines where you get to select the institution. So those kind of things will kind of help you along the way. Um, because if it is a designated host institution mentioned in the award, University of Udine or Rome or whatever, and they're not replying, time to look elsewhere, you know. So that could be something that involves your pathway. Yeah. So AU has a fairly large proportion of the international faculty are permanent residents eligible for any of these grants or are they strictly for citizens? Their citizenship is required. So when applicants who have green cards are you know, becoming a citizen, you're welcome to apply. So um, so speaking of non-citizens, I just wanted to kind of wrap it up with discussing the other side of the program. So we talked about sending U.S. citizens abroad. If you yourself are not able to um, to go abroad for, you know, things don't line up, um, we always welcome you to, you know, we encourage you to host a foreign full writer who's based uh, abroad. Um, and again, it's, it's the other side of the program, so they would apply through their country's embassy or commission. Um, but that's one way to internationalize your department, uh, your campus in general. So. There's um, kind of three different ways of doing that. One would be through the traditional um, research or teaching. In this case, for the Visiting Scholar Program, it's heavily oriented towards research. Um, but then also, uh, there's the SIR or the OLF. So the SIR is the Scholar Residence. That's primarily for teaching. So scholars who come here who want to teach, and they need a place to teach an undergraduate course for a semester or for a year. Or the OLF, which is the Outreach Lecturing Fund. That's a great opportunity. Let's say there's a, a Fulbright scholar locally, let's say at Georgetown or University of Virginia or what have, wherever that's you know, kind of close by. They're here doing their one year Fulbright grant at that university, but they're an expert in something that they're also teaching. And you'd love to have them come over for the day or for a couple of days to do a lecture or a workshop or what have you. So you can request that scholar to come um, and do a well. So that's kind of. Those are the offerings on the other side of the program. So, if you like, if you'd like more information, you can. Uh, well, you'll be getting all of this in the PowerPoint. Yeah. Uh, just a quick note: uh, the presentation and other resource links will be posted below the Chalk Talk series uh, under this beautiful bright session. And so, the, the email that we sent out for you to register, if you go back to that site, you should be able to see all of the resources listed under that uh, session. 